Welcome to the Complexity Theory Podcast. My name is Zach McCormick, and today we're going to give you a little different show. It's more topical and a little bit more condensed, and I'm calling it Food for Thought. While I've you know, frequently kept an eye on what seems to be in the popular consciousness at any given time just by going on social media sites and news sites and, you know, the usual. Um, I noticed a little theme and it was something that kind of caught my attention. It's the idea that things cost a lot more now than they did before. And that's something I'd always taken for granted. But I started to do a little bit more of a deep dive. I started to notice posts, for instance, um, saying things like stuff ought to cost less. You know, rent ought to cost $600 a month and a a uh, full tank of gas ought to cost twenty dollars, and and things of that type. And of course, you know, I got a good chuckle out of it because I can remember when those were the costs. But I decided to look into it a little bit further, and and I came across one infographic, as it's called, that really seemed to sum things up. And it's hard to say for sure, of course, whether these things are are strictly accurate. It's clearly an uh, an amalgamation. It's an approximation of what. Um, what things looked like a century ago, and then actually every decade up up until now. So the title was kind of interesting. It seems to be pretty tongue-in-cheek, um, and it's, it's titled, What Could You Buy With a Nickel? A Century of Chump Change. And, and underneath it has a little, little <clears throat> extra descriptor that talks about um, how what was considered real money is today considered effectively a pittance. So it caught my attention, and we're going to pull it up right now. And what you can see is that back in the 1900s, a penny bought you something. And that's, I realized, not the case today. I can't think of a single instance where a single U.S. penny would actually buy you a specific good um, or service. And yet, as you're looking through this, you see that at least someone was willing to sell a piece of candy for a penny. Um, And as you kind of go through this, you look at that top row and you see, well, let's see what a nickel bought. Well, a nickel would have purchased a a ticket of some kind, Uh, maybe not to what we would have thought today as a traditional movie, but, you know, at the time in the 1900s, the equivalent, um, a dime would have gotten you a a pretty sizable amount of food. In this case, they cited to a pound of lamb chops. And as you go up, you see it. A quarter, three cans of soup, a dollar would have purchased women's leather shoes. And $10 could have paid a month of rent in a five-room house. And that and that really gave me food for thought. It really got me wondering how is it that things went from being at that price to what they are now? How is it that even just 10 years ago, things were so much less expensive? And of course, the answers are pretty nuanced. They're pretty complicated in some respect. But this this diagram really served to show and highlight this interesting phenomenon. And I'll just give you a few more highlights from I won't read all of them, but we'll put a link to it. It was something that uh, we came across, I think, on Reddit. And even as recently as the middle of the century, you could still go a long way with a small amount of change. You know, you could still buy a Coke for a nickel in the 40s and maybe early 50s. You could still buy uh, a fairly sizable amount of food with a dime. And as you look, even as recently as the 2000s, a dollar would still get you a burger. Maybe not something that you would consider to be a, a very you know, qualitative uh, burger, but a burger nonetheless. Uh, and $10, even in the 2000s, could buy you a movie ticket. So look how far we've come. In just a century, we've gone from pennies being worth something to pennies being basically nothing more than weights in our pocket. Uh, And then it started me down another course. I started to wonder, has this happened before? Is this just an American phenomenon? Is it simply the case that stuff costs more as time goes by? Which, by the way, if you want to get technical, the word for that is usually inflation. It's not always um, the only thing that causes things to get more expensive, but it is the word most commonly used. So my question 
was looking at this, just scrolling, you know, not paying much attention to it, not expecting to think uh, in terms of making a show out of it. Is there more? And we we said, well, let's look, look back in history. Let's take a look and see if there are other examples. Uh, there were quite a few, but the one that jumped out the most, interestingly enough, was one of the oldest examples because it took us back to the Roman Empire, kind of a, a then and now type situation. And one of the things we saw was that the Roman Empire utilized currencies um, that are not totally unfamiliar to us today. Uh, they used silver, gold, and bronze coins. Uh, the most commonly known was called the denarius. That was a silver coin. It was roughly the size of either a nickel or a dime, probably in between that size. It contained about four and a half grams of pure silver when it was first used. But this chart here in particular um, drew attention to the fact that in the beginning of this currency, the silver content was almost pure. And over the span of approximately 300 years, it dropped to being almost nothing. And, and then, of course, uh, I realized that this is actually very similar to the trajectory that American coinage has taken because in the... In the first and earliest years of the minting process um, within the United States, coins were mostly silver, just as they were in the Roman Empire. And we now see that most coinage today contains no actual silver. There, there is a silver appearance. It's a combination. It's an alloy. The core of the coin is usually comprised of zinc and a few other things, some, some copper, but even that... Um, seems to be less and less prevalent. And and I thought that was a purely American thing. I thought it was just a product of, okay, well, we're using digital currency. What do we really need coins for? You know, that kind of a thing. But interestingly enough, it turns out that that was something that was, that was actually done um, way back when, you know, more than 2,000 years ago. And we saw another interesting element, which was the fact that basically inflation existed in Roman times. And this was, this was interesting because in the beginning, in the early days of Rome, the coinage itself seems to have what they call an inverted relationship to the value. In other words, the more silver there is, the more valuable uh, the currency was, the less inflation there was. And remember, inflation means that you usually you get less of a particular good or service for your money. And so what we see is that towards the end of the Roman Empire, which also happened to be around the time when the content of the metal coins was changing, it went from being almost all silver to being uh, lesser quality metals, which at the time was bronze, it seems, or even brass, uh, they they had a, a very heavy inflationary effect. So in or around 200, 220 or so AD, the Roman emperor was increasing his wages primarily to his soldiers. And you can see an interesting quote attributed to Caracalla, um, which it looks to have been a Caesar in uh, 210 AD, and, and the quote reads, Nobody should have any money but I, so that I may bestow it upon my soldiers. And underneath underneath that quote, it, it points to the fact that he did, in fact, give his soldiers a pay rise of approximately 50% right around that same time. And a few decades after that, by 265 AD, at least according to this particular report, what you see is that there was only approximately uh, half of a percent of silver left in the Roman coin, the, the main Roman coin. They had gold coins as well. They had copper. They had brass. But their main coin was the denarius, and it was the silver coin that I talked about earlier. And by 265 AD, there was only half a percent of silver left in those coins. And prices then, according to this, skyrocketed by many, many times, in this case, a thousand percent, you know, I'm, I'm sure that was an average across, across the, uh, across the empire. Producer Midge needs to be heard. Oh, I was just going to point out here, it says the uh, barbarian mercenaries were paid in cold. Those barbarians were the Germanic tribes. Yeah. So it's interesting that there would have been such a distinction there because it seems like there must have been some kind of a cultural sort of a differentiation. Why was it that mercenaries demanded payment in gold um, as opposed to silver, which seems to have been the predominant currency at the time? And, and it seems to be an almost reversal of what we see today. Most people think of gold as the preferable metal and silver as being less preferable. But 
it, it was it was fascinating because it seems as if we have a history repeating itself situation. Uh, you saw prices skyrocket, and you saw the, the the metal content drop. So frequently, what that's called is uh, that's called deflation. Not just deflation, but it's actually the act of reducing the content of, in this case, valuable metal within the actual currency. Some might call it devaluation. Um, some might call it dilution of the currency. But but what you can see in this diagram here, it's a visual representation. I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit. And what you see is that in the early portion of the Roman Empire, you saw that the coins, these are the denarii, by the way, this is what they looked like. And for those who are listening, it's a it's a bust. It's a, a man in profile. He's facing to the right of the coin as you hold it facing up with uh, writing around the periphery. It, it honestly looks a lot like some of the modern coins. In fact, it reminds me of a dime, actually, an American dime. Um, and what they're showing in this infographic is they have the denarii. Probably it looks like about to scale. And they have a red border around the circumference of the coin. And in the early stages of its usage, they're showing that the, the purity was at uh, close to 90%. That is 90% silver. But by the time they started the devaluation program, what they were doing was they were actually reducing the silver content. And again, the infographic shows you that the red, the red border basically signifies that reduction. So that was, that was very interesting because I started to think again about present day. And the question is, well, you know, did, did the United States use metal? Is, is that why there was such a similarity between then and now? You know, and the answer is yes, we did, actually. We used silver coinage. We actually had gold coins as well, but silver was the most common. That's why the quarters and the dimes and the nickels, that's why they have a silver appearance at one point. They actually were silver. I actually was able to lay my hands on, on one, and this, this is, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get this in shot, but this is an American silver dollar, and it is from 1923. So I thought that was kind of interesting because it's, it's literally 100 years old as we're filming this. And this coin, we did some research on it. So this coin was actually 90% silver. It contains about about um, seventy five to almost eighty percent of a troy ounce worth of silver. And for reference, we were able to get a full troy ounce of silver. And this is actually another American coin. Um, and this is what's called a silver eagle. This is minted by the U.S. Mint. I'm going to put it down next for reference. And that's actually legal tender as well, which was also interesting to discover. That's a coin that's in current production right now, and it contains one troy ounce of silver, but it costs, give or take, about 30 or so dollars to purchase. Your, your great uncles uh, used that 1923 coin as currency in uh, parts of the north. Yeah, so it was it was it was lawful currency, lawful tender, and, and to my knowledge still is. And the interesting thing about it was that the silver dollar from 1923, I think they call these liberty dollars, I think. We've got a, a bust of a female in profile and she's facing to the left as you hold it up. So this this would have actually been the dollar that you that you used to buy. And going back to that first infographic, what we see there is a very similar looking coin. And look what it would have would have purchased in 1900 a pair of leather shoes. I can't. I don't know if you could even go into a into a thrift shop or a secondhand store and buy a qualitative pair of of women's leather shoes for a dollar today. No, you can't. <clears throat> so it's it's a fascinating thing because why would someone, why would a cobbler, why would a manufacturer have parted with such a qualitative good or service for such a seemingly small amount of money? And that's that's really what got me thinking about this whole thing in the first place. Um, and then and then I started to dig into well, wait a minute, we don't use silver dollars anymore. Why don't we use silver dollars? And the answer that came back was, well, because the value of the dollar 
has has fluctuated. The American paper dollar, which we discovered was actually also a somewhat recent uh, creation, started to diverge. What I mean is the silver coin started to be collected. It started to be held. People would prefer to hold on to the, to the actual metal and spend the paper. So what you started to see, it seems, is that people were actually taking these coins out of circulation because they valued the metal more than they, they valued the dollar. What then happened with the dollar, the paper money at the time, was that it, it started to, it didn't go as far. And that's what's reflected in this graph. You start to see this progression in time. Imagine if you were tracking, for instance, the price of a dozen eggs through each decade. If you did that, you would see this steady uptick. And it's, and it's simple. The, the cost of the silver also went up. And so basically, by today's standards, <clears throat> one of these coins now would take 30 or so dollars to buy. And so, and so we had effectively a devaluation. And, and that's something that happened in Roman times as well. Well, I was going to say the, the, the same thing happened with the dollar. As they printed more dollars, they realized, well, the dollars are worth less so the, but compared to the silver coins. That's why people started hoarding the coins because they kept printing more dollars. Yeah, and that's you you put it better than I just did. It was it was the debasement apparently that was occurring. The why of course seems to be seems to be less easy to identify, but but the effect seems eerily similar and how could you have how could you have such a thing as that occur essentially in the same way twice? You know, how could you 2, have 2000 years apart? Exactly. And yeah. that was that was the thing that that sort of caught my attention and of course there were other there were other corollaries the old cor you know correlation does not equate to causation of course is true but it does seem that in roman times at least there was an uptick in the number in, in the destabilizing events in other words rome seemed to be stable for a time towards the end of the roman empire it appears as if you saw um well right here for instance hmm. hyperinflation taxes seem to have gone up um and there seems to have been negative effects on the trade that Rome conducted with other with other areas. I would say that might have been due to the devaluing of their own coins, that the other merchants who would trade with Rome were not willing to accept Rome's coinage anymore. Uh, that would make sense. I mean, that's the other interesting thing is that when you when you talk about money, one of the things that always struck me as a surprise was how much psychology there is in it. Because it's clear from this that paper money has not always been a thing. In, in fact, paper was at one time itself incredibly valuable. And so they wouldn't have used it as money because people would have simply kept it for other purposes. So it's interesting to note that much of money is simply what people think is going to be valuable and nothing more than that. Though... One other question that I had was, why is it that precious metals seem to, throughout history, have been the thing that people wanted? Why are humans attracted to the shiny? Uh, and I don't have a set answer there, except that perhaps it's, it's a combination of very interesting... Here's a picture, by the way, of a, of a denarii. This, this is actually a real coin. And you can, you can kind of see, again, for the folks who are listening... It looks a lot like a dime. Um, it looks like you have the face of a Caesar on it. And there's the other side. Well, and also the, uh, the, the precious metal coins are uniform and they're durable. And that's one of the reasons they were uh, pr preferred. Yeah, so I don't have a solid answer. But what I, what I found was there, was there was some hypotheses. The ones that seemed to make the most sense were that this particular type of metal, gold, silver, copper, bronze, uh, to a lesser extent brass, they possess certain qualities and they exist in a finite quantity. So there's only so much silver, there's only so much gold in the earth, and therefore, very similar to how Bitcoin has an intrinsic limiter on it, right? 
Bitcoin can only be produced after the computation is completed, and those computations are more and more difficult as time goes on. Likewise, there is a theoretical end to the amount of gold or silver that could be extracted from the Earth. So the hypothesis seems to have been that because everybody knows that this stuff could run out, and it takes effort, there's, there's literal work required to both find it, extract it, refine it, mint it, and distribute it, that humans have settled on this particular medium as a very lasting, very lasting type of uh, what they call store of value. It's, it's a representation of energy goes the hypothesis. It's something that basically um, represents work. So, you know, if, if I did work for somebody, I could demand payment in anything. I could say, you know, give me a pair of shoes or give me some wheat or whatever. I could do that, but it's not practical. I can't really carry, you know, a bushel of wheat in my pocket. I can't easily trade that. It requires, it requires work to do. Whereas instead I could bring something like a silver coin with me and I could, and I could say, I'll give you this. And, and it's, it's a representation of that value that I would mm -hmm. otherwise have had. So again, back to that psychology, um, which it was just fascinating to see that I never really thought of money that way. I always sort of took for granted that, you know, a dollar in my, in my wallet or in my bank account was just, a dollar. I never really looked into it more, but it seems like throughout history, human beings have, um, they've really, they've really had both sort of certain things that are consistent. And then there's also this high level of variability as soon as you deviate from that stuff. So as you know, everyone seems to be fine, accepting the shiny, um, in trade for goods and services. As soon as, as soon as you start reducing the shiny though, it seems like for, for reasons that may never be fully known, problems ensue. So that was kind of the food for thought um, like moment. Thing, like things haven't changed in 2,000 years. <laughs> well, the technology's clearly changed. I mean, we're, we're using stuff that Romans couldn't have even dreamed of, but it does seem like at its core, maybe, maybe things, you know, are really not that different, especially when we started to see that pattern of debasement, especially as we started to see the corollary between what most I, I, it seems like what most historians agree on would have been the period of time where the Roman Empire broke down. One thing that did come out in, in the research was there is no one point. No one can actually say the day that Rome fell because it really there really wasn't one day. And indeed, you had <clears throat> you had bastions essentially that that prevailed, you know, for many centuries thereafter, arguably in some cases, even through to present day. But in terms of Rome at its height, it seems like, debasement of the currency happened around the same time that they started to, the Romans started to lose their grip on their empire. Again, I don't know if there's causation there or not, but that seems to have been the pattern. And it just it was interesting. Like I said, I don't I don't yeah, I don't know what I don't know what to make of it past that, but when when I started to see that, you know, I mean, TikTok has people talking about the prices then and now. So, so kids, you know, less than half my age are talking about, about economics. And that, I suppose, was the thing that got me thinking the most. Again, food for thought. Hope you've enjoyed this little excerpt. Um, we'll have more of these coming up uh, in the future. And, um, of course, as always, we appreciate your subscriptions and your likes and your shares. It always helps. We'll look for you next time.